Food & Wine Insider is a weekly look at a $1.5 trillion industry touching every American. And Deb Gabor is CEO of Saul Marketing, a brand strategy consultancy. As we have seen on this program, the successful leaders in our industry understand the importance of branding in this highly competitive market. She's here to talk about ways new and old companies can build brands and also talk about the problem Domino has. Deb, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, w- without further ado, here's Anne. Hey, Anne. Again, uh, hey, Deb. Again, this is uh, Deb Gabor. She's CEO of Saul Marketing. Um, she's worked with well-known companies like Dell and Microsoft and NBC Universal, digital winners like All Recipes and Retail Me Not. Um, and I really welcome you to Food and Wine Insider. And I, I do want to talk about brands um, because brand, I'm very passionate about brands. I've been around brands all my life. And I, I sometimes hear that people think that brands are dead. And I was sort of I cringe at that. But um, I thought the interesting uh, recent story is about Papa John's and uh, the ouster of the founder and the former chairman, John Schnatter, uh, Schnatter. And I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about that. So um, if you're good to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue that first, and then we're going to talk about some branding stuff. As most people know, John Snatter resigned his chairmanship after having made some uh, racial comments, and the board of the company then announced that he would cease all media appearances and not make any further statements to the media regarding the company, its business, or its employees. The brand is the founder, and so how will Papa John survive from a brand standpoint? Well, you know, it remains to be seen how they'll survive, but, you know, given their last earnings announcement, their stock is down 5%. The the brand was already kind of circling the drain anyway. I think that, you know, the infighting between John Schnatter and uh, the current management of the company is not helping things. They've turned this whole situation into a massive, the only word I can think of for this is a dumpster fire, basically. Um, you know, this is, this is one of those cases I always recommend to anybody who's building a brand, don't put all of your branding eggs in a single basket with like a single person who is the face and the likeness and the voice and really sort of the essence of the brand. It puts your brand at significant risk. And I think in the case of Papa John's, Papa John himself is the brand. And while that brand was very popular because, you know, it, uh, a lot of a lot of popularity because here was, you know, an entrepreneur who bootstrapped it. He sold his car to start the company. A lot of people really resonated with this, like, regular guy, gone gone good story. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I, I feel like both Schnatter's ego and – you know, the company's unwillingness to accept responsibility for putting all their eggs in this one branding basket, you know, both those things are contributing to, you know, what may be uh, the downfall of this company. Now, while I say that brand is definitely going to have a lot to do with it, if the company doesn't do something very quickly to turn this around, uh, I know that that sales were declining. Uh, there have been, you know, and I'm not an expert on the food industry. I'm an expert on brand, but I'm always paying attention to brands. I know that over the last year, in addition to this one incident, you know, there was Schnatter's disagreement with the NFL. There were also quality problems, you know, a change of ingredients that were actually going into the product, uh, you know, some distribution and selling problems and things like that. And then, you know, increased competition and uh, growing brand affinity for competing brands like like Domino's and Pizza Hut. So there's a lot of stuff at work here. Um, I don't have a crisp, crystal ball to, to say, you know, will this brand survive or will it die? Uh, it certainly looks like it's circling the drain, though. Hmm. You know, as you mentioned, the company has been in decline, which can't all be put on Mr. Schnatter. What do they need to do to right the ship? 
So anytime an organization goes through a brand disaster, they need to take the steps to kind of look inside and and determine, you know, what is the root cause of this? So no amount of good branding and no amount of good marketing can make up for the misgivings of a bad corporate culture or poor business practices or reduced quality on the product and distribution and selling side of things. Um, The, you know, really for brands to be able to turn around the nosedive that's caused by by a disaster like this, they have to examine their entire operations through and through and really um, clarify and and I'll say, you know, reinforce what their values and beliefs are as an organization, get everybody back on the same page with regard to what truly the mission of the organization is. Make sure that, that employees at every level of the organization are indoctrinated to what the organization's core values are. Ensure that those core values are ultimately aligned with customers because at the end of the day, a brand is like a magnet that's designed to attract to it people who share the values and beliefs with the organization that's behind that brand. And when you have a brand that behaves in a way that's in conflict with the values and beliefs of customers, employees, partners, and even investors, that's when you have a broken brand promise. So, you know, in order to turn on that tailspin, I think it's something way more, uh, way bigger than than just a a PR kind of activity. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. And, you know, that relationship between uh, Mr. Snatter and the board, you know, you have have this uh, very broad sort of effect because it's, not just the employees, it's not just the customers, you have franchisees, it could make any, any one of them sort of feel uncomfortable. And I, I wonder if you think that it will, oh, I'm sure it already has, had a negative impact overall on the brand, but how do you recover from that? You know, how do, how do they possibly sort of, I recall, you know, when there was the the Tylenol scare, which was a a long, long time ago, it was the immediacy of of addressing it. It was the immediacy of the chairperson saying something about it and making taking very fast action, pulling all the product off the shelf that that reinvigorated sort of confidence in the brand. I don't know what's happened with Papa John's to do any of that, except I think they've they may think that it'll just go away over time. <laughs> yeah, you not know, going to do. I have to say, you know, I I am a I am a student and like freak I'll I'll say frequent commenter on on brand crises, especially over the last two years. I mean, you know, I I've seen everything from, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, Chick Fil A and. Um, what's the other restaurant that comes top of mind? It's Chick Fil A. I also think of uh, Cracker Barrel. You know, so, you know some of the Starbucks more recently. Um, you know, obviously Uber, United Airlines, Wells Fargo, et cetera, et cetera. I have not seen yet a case like this where the you know the the where you have like the founder and the face of the company and the company like pointing fingers at each other and laying blame. And so you ask the question of what does a brand need to do in order to recover from something this? And, you know, as in the Tylenol incident many, many years ago, and that's like the classic crisis communication case study from business school that we all study. The world is very, very different today. And, and immediacy is absolutely paramount. You know, if you don't get out there with a state, and take responsibility and hold yourself accountable as an organization for everything, whether or not you know you you actually perpetrated any ill will against another person or not. If you're not doing that, you know, pretty instantaneously after a crisis comes to light, you're letting the world take on the role of carrying your narrative. I always tell people, I'm like, you have to control the narrative. You have to control the story. You need to be out there as soon as possible because we we live in an always on on demand communications environment where people people with smartphones and people at their desktop computers and on tablets have a platform to communicate with literally thousands of people you know at the at the push of a button so if the company isn't controlling the narrative you're letting the world do that so speed and immediacy are paramount the next thing is authenticity and showing regard for humanity 
one of the things that has been absent from this case for me um, with Papa John's is that neither party, neither John Schnatter or the Papa John's Corporation, has done what I feel is I, a good job of, of accepting responsibility and showing regard for people whose feelings might have been hurt. Um, and so showing regard for humanity uh, while you're conducting an investigation is also really important. You go back to that Tylenol incident. That's one of the things that Johnson & Johnson did really well was, you know, they were out there making a statement right away. They took responsibility. They took action. But through all of that, they showed regard and care for the people who were involved. Kind of the third step in managing through a crisis like this, you know, once you've taken responsibility, is to report to the world here's what we're going to do. So I understand in the timeline of events, which seems to still be developing, that Papa John's Corporation is bringing in some kind of an investigation from the outside. Tell us when that's going to happen. Tell us who's conducting that investigation. And then most importantly, tell us when you're going to update us on the findings. And then, you know, the final thing is to reinforce what the positive values are of the organization while all this is going on. And so companies that do this really well in the face of crisis are able to maintain a positive relationship with customers over a long period of time. And so, you know, I think about, I, I think about Starbucks, which went through, they, they went through a brand disaster. It wasn't at the hand of their founder or, you know, the single individual who was like the face of the company, but they did a lot of these things really right when when they had their issue last spring. And and I think that they're kind of a model for dealing with with com communicating with their public through a crisis in an immediate and authentic and and caring fashion. Now, I think that was perfect in terms of your your four points. And again, we're talking with Deb Gabor, she's CEO of Saul Marketing. You know, it's it's very interesting when you think about founders and and I, I've worked with a lot of people who are founders in their business and what they believe in and how they bring the, the business to a certain point. And because um, they, they've created the vision and the direction and their, their stake is very personal. I think of Stephen Jobs who led Apple. He was removed by his board. Then he returned again. Um, you know, for, for Mr. Snatter, he owns 30 percent of the stock. And it's sort of it's a little bit more than personal. What would he need to do to protect his personal brand reputation? Never mind his financial interest, but his personal brand reputation. Yeah, I, you know, I doubt that that guy could go out anywhere and get any job right now doing anything other than like being a pain in the ass to the uh, Papa John's Corporation right now. I mean, that guy, um, it'd be interesting to see if he can repair his personal brand. His personal brand is, you know, indelibly intertwined with Papa John's and the founder story and all this kind of stuff. I think that this is a case, unlike Steve Jobs, um, who, you know, also was known, uh, you know, the legends are that he was, you know, he, he was an egomaniac or a megalomaniac. Um, definitely not on the order of the Papa John CEO here. I don't know if you saw this interview. I believe it was late last week um, where, he sat down with ABC News and he also talked to the Associated Press and, and basically was, you know, trying to say, like, my image needs to be back in the stores and on the boxes and I'm the whole reason that this brand, you know, that this, this brand exists and I'm the whole, you know, I'm, I'm going to be solely responsible for saving the brand. That is a really, really sort of selfish kind of point of view. And I don't know that today's consumers are really bonding with human beings who, who sort of have that kind of affect that really don't show any regard for all of the other people in the ecosystem that, that contributed to that brand's success. I mean, you mentioned it yourself at the beginning. You said, you know, Papa John's is more than just the corporation itself, and it's more than just Schnatter. It's employees, it's franchisees, it's, you know, it's uh, the, the people that they source uh, ingredients and product from. It's the communities where these Papa John's restaurants are, and it's customers. It includes all of those people. It also, since they're a publicly held company, it includes their, their shareholders. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, the company is not just this one megalomaniacal human being, um, I, don't, I, I don't know if he can repair his his personal brand. I mean, he you have a brand whether you like it or not. I mean, you have to 
you have to you have to understand that and and you have to realize that and and even the people we don't like they have very distinctive personal brands you know i think about politicians right they they all have a personal brand um this may be the brand that he's trying to create but i have a feeling it's going to repel more people than it's going to attract so you know it's because you have so many companies through which a brand is is very close to the founder and the founder's image as, as companies mature and you have boards and you become you know, obviously a public company and so on, what are the types of things that a company really needs to do to protect itself so that it doesn't wind up, it's almost like a disaster recovery <laughs> strategy, yeah. but what does it need to really have in place to, to, to mitigate this, this potentially happening? Yeah, I you know, I, I can divide this into like two two sections. I can talk about like new brands starting up and what they should be thinking about and then brands that maybe are already out there where maybe they're very, very close they're tied very closely to the personal brand or the image of a founder. My own company, which has been around for fifteen years, um, is is fortunately and unfortunately very, very dependent on me as an individual. Um, I also have like a really distinctive personal brand in that I write books and I travel all over the world speaking to organizations and I do interviews, you know, as a branding expert and I, you know, I contribute to a lot of conversations as an influencer. And then I also have my company brand. But for many years, like my own personal brand was so closely tied to the company that I actually was keeping it from growing, right? Because I, you know, the the, the business was so highly dependent on me as an individual. So I would say if you are a mature organization and you have a brand that is highly dependent on a founder um, or, you know, sort of like a single leader within the organization, I would say you have to, you have to identify, you know, how far can that scale? Um, when I started this company 15 years ago, I, I, you know, I was smart enough at that time. I didn't know anything about business, but I was smart enough at that time to, to understand I didn't want to name the company after myself because I knew that someday I wanted the company to be bigger than me as an individual. And so like every day is a process for me to get out of the way to ensure that every single person at the company and all of the systems and processes and tools that we use here in serving our clients all deliver on the ultimate brand promise, which doesn't require me individually to deliver on that. So, you know, for existing companies that are maybe tied too closely to a leader or, you know, a single person for branding, it really is the process of identifying, like, what is our brand promise and how do we ensure that every single person at every level of the organization, from the CEO on down to the person who is emptying trash cans, can deliver ultimately on that brand promise. For new companies, I say, when you're in the early stage, it is so important to build a brand foundation from the beginning that is so um, that is you know mission and mission and and profit driven like you know no no margin no mission I usually say like you know you're in business to make money but you need to have a you need to have like a very mission and vision informed brand that's inclusive of your customers so it really is about building a brand um, that makes your customers the heroes in their own lives and bonds with them in a deeply emotional way so that as you go through the twists and turns of business and you know unfortunately the incidents and crises that face us all, small and large, because, you know what, one thing's for sure, you know, disaster is, is going to happen, even if it's a small one. You need to have like a bunch of positive equity built up in your emotional bank account with your customers so that they are loyal to you when there is a hiccup, there is a misstep. And when I say a crisis, that could be something, you know, in the, in the food business, that could be something like, I, one of my favorite brands here in Texas is Bluebell Ice Cream. Mm. And um, you know, that's a, that's a story of what I call irrational loyalty. And they've done such a good job of creating this condition of irrational loyalty where the bonds with the brand are so strong that if something really horrible happens with the brand, and in the case of Bluebell Ice Cream, they killed 11 people, right, with a listeria breakout in their plant, if something really bad happens with the brand – 
and you behave in a really, truly authentic and loving way towards your, your customers and your employees and, and your stakeholders, you know, through that disaster, you can emerge on the other side stronger. So, you know, my, my, I usually tell people like, you know, branding is like sex in that it's, you know, designed to, to elevate people's self-concepts and make them feel like they want to take a role in the hay. When you're, when you're building the company, don't build the company just to attract people build the company to attract people and hold them in a loving relationship over a long period of time so that when one of the partners in the relationship trades in their their rose-colored glasses for a pair of dirty sweatpants, the relationship can endure. You know, when we're looking at uh, food products, how – how do people go about that? I, you know, I, I think some feel like, well, social media has allowed there to be more of an even playing field in terms of, you know, uh, developing your brand. But I'm curious to hear, um, it's, it's a bit of a new world order. You can, is the, what's the role of the brand and, and especially for new businesses and how best can people bring the, the, um, the personality, the mission, the foundation, the promise uh, to the consumer in ways that are, are new and refreshing and, and lend themselves to the reputation of the brand. Yeah, so, you know, you're exactly right that the Internet has sort of leveled the playing field. Frankly, it's Amazon and the FBA program that's leveled the, leveled the playing field for, for really anybody with a product to bring it to market. And then, you know, when you're doing that and you're using Amazon or you're really, you know, building an e-commerce business, it's a customer acquisition game. It's not necessarily like a long-term customer loyalty, you know, lifetime, customer lifetime value game, whereas, you know, looking to build a brand that's highly extensible and has a lot of equity and drives, you know, profit margins and, you know, allows you to create a legacy on which to, you know, build the brand for the long term. Those are two different strategies. If you're looking to build a brand, you know, I kind of, I kind of boil it down to, um, to this. And if, if people who are listening to this take only one thing away from this conversation, I, I want them to understand about this. So, at the end of the day, people don't buy things. They don't buy products. They, they buy relationships. They buy experiences. They buy memories and expectations. And they buy things, the food they eat, the clothes they wear, the cars they drive, you know, even the retailers and restaurants that they patronize. They all are part of a person's assemblage of their self-concept. So people – People are buying something because they like what it says about them to them and what it says about them to other people. And the, the process of branding, um, you know, if you're coming to market with something, if you do nothing else except answer these three questions about your product when you think about going to market and how you're going to market it, then you will be so far ahead of everyone else who is just out there trying to acquire customers and get a single sale versus those who are developing a relationship. And those questions are, I always encourage people to ask these questions. What do you want it to say about a customer that they use your brand? What does it say about them that they use your brand? That's the first question, which goes into, you know, what are the self-expressive benefits of the brand? How does the brand elevate their self-concept? The second question speaks to differentiation. And this differentiation is a higher order of differentiation versus, you know, the kind of differentiation that we think about in product positioning, which is um, do we have better ingredients or do we have higher quality ingredients or, you know, does it cost less or is it more available, whatever. I'm really talking about singularity and indispensability here. It's asking the question of what is the singular thing that we want a customer to get from us that they don't get from anywhere else. And that really speaks to indispensability and singularity. And it's the hardest question in branding to answer. And, you know, in my daily work with clients, like this is the one that they struggle with the most. But you just continue to ask that question, what do you want that one thing to be? Mm-hmm. And that really, really speaks to, you know, how a, how a product or a service or, or you know, even a, a restaurant can bond with somebody deeply and emotionally. And then the final question, and this is the most important question, is thinking about your customer. Like who is your customer? 
customer and put them into the scenario, how do you make them the hero in their own story? So every single customer is trying to create a story for their lives while you're trying to create the story for your business. You build a brand around the story that your ideal customer is trying to tell for themselves and they get to be the protagonist, and you get to make them the hero of their own story. So how does your product make them the hero of their own story? And so the answering of those three questions, what does it say about a person they use your brand, what's the singular thing they get from you they can't get anywhere else, or how do you make your customer a hero in their own story, the combination of the answers to those three questions, in essence, is the brand. And that's how you should go to market because what that does is it helps you identify ultimately who do you want to align with? You know, what are your values and beliefs that are shared with that individual? And how do you help them tell or how do you help them tell their story? Because how you help them tell their story is how you tell your story. Does that all make sense? I know I I it was actually quite brilliant. Uh <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I ask the question. So if your brand, if your product, is, your brand didn't exist anymore, who would care? Right. Yeah. Same thing. I, same thing. It's, but, yeah. We, but it's. I think you're you're really pointing out the really important things. Is about. Um, you know, what is? Uh, I've worked on lots of different brands, and it's sort of the reason I carry this brand is it's saying something about me. It's not saying something about the product. It's saying something about me. When I offer it to someone else and that brand is present, what is it saying about me? And then yep. the differentiation, as you're saying, is, you know, the, that singularity and indispensability, you can only get it here, is very, very critical. And I thought the, your third point about making the customer the hero of the story is quite, quite interesting in terms of a, the whole approach, but I think it does wrap it, wrap it all together. Um, I know Don's going to be giving me the hook any second now, but I could talk about brands for the next couple of hours. So, <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, we, once, I, I wanted to come back. Um, you know, we, we talk about the head of a company, but um, the board has a responsibility as well. And I think boards, especially in public companies, of whether it's governance or, or how um, they need to operate is, is much more critical today than it ever has been, especially if a, if a company winds up in, in crisis mode. Um, you know, what, what are the things the board should be doing to bring confidence back when there's a crisis? Um, I, I think that, you know, a board really needs to be in alignment with the with the officers of the corporation, um, alignment and making sure that everybody is speaking the same language, everyone is is carrying the same messages, that they're reinforcing each other, um, that the board is indicating confidence in the leadership's team to be able to right the ship after after something bad happens. I think all of those things are really, really essential. The other thing that a board can provide, because you know they're there to provide oversight and government governance and you know support to the organization is to hold the leaders of the organization accountable um, for preparing for disaster and hold them accountable for having a healthy brand and having a healthy corporate culture that that is capable of delivering on the value proposition and promises of the brand. I think healthy company means healthy brand in this case. And ultimately, you know, uh, a corporate board having this role in governance can help, you know, support and align with the leadership team um, and, and provide some of that accountability and oversight to ensure that the company conducts itself in all of its actions at every level of the organization in a way that that is upholding the values and beliefs of the organization. And and to me, when I see where a, where a board is failing an organization is when they're part of the finger pointing and blame game. Um, hmm. So when you know, when everybody is aligned and everyone is speaking the same language and they're all showing regard for every single person who is impacted, whether that be, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally, or financially by, you know, by the brand that, that everybody is ultimately aligned, then there can be no question, right? Again, it goes all the way back to if you don't control the narrative, then you let the market control the narrative. Anytime there's like a chink in the armor, someone's going to jump in with a sword and stick it in there. So, um, 
you know, that's the ultimate thing that I think a, a that a board can do. Well, I want to thank Deb Gabor. She's CEO of Soul Marketing, and I'm going to turn it back to Don so he can wrap us up. And Deb, thank you so much for being on Food and Wine Insider. Thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. You ask awesome questions. You know, I got so interested in listening to branding, which is always such an um, important topic. We've been talking with Deb Gabor. She is CEO of Soul Marketing. Deb, what is your website? So the company website is soul, S-O-L, marketing.com. And then also, if you're interested in my book, there's a whole website dedicated to that, and that's brandingissex.com. We didn't even get to talk about that much. But a, a link <laughs> to the website will be on Food and Wine Insider tonight, where you can hear this and every other past and future Food and Wine Insider program. And you can also tell us by a survey of guests you'd like to hear on the program. Thank you so much, Deb, for being with us. Thank you. We will be back with our guest after these messages. To be successful, most restaurant owners require extra capital from time to time. When you need funding to renovate, buy equipment, or manage cash flow, you don't have time to track down financial statements or wait weeks for a decision. That's where Cabbage can help. Cabbage gives small businesses access to a line of credit of up to $200,000. Apply online and you'll get a decision right away. Since Cabbage is a line of credit, you can take the exact amount you need. You never have to reapply to take additional loans and you'll only pay for the funds you use. Cabbage has helped more than 230,000 businesses from every industry. And with $4 billion in funding, Cabbage is A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau and was named the Forbes Top 100 Companies twice in a row. Check out Cabbage at cabbagewithak.com slash food and wine and you'll get a $50 gift card when you qualify. That's K A B B A G E dot com slash food and wine. Line of credit is subject to credit approval. See terms and conditions. All cabbage business loans are issued by Celtic Bank, a Utah chartered industrial bank, member FDIC. And we have a fascinating new guest joining us now. Any. Bistrom leads Cider and Love, and I, I, I absolutely adore the uh, the name, the title, and she's going to tell us about uh, her really great company. Well, Annie, welcome to the program, and Anne, it's all yours. Thank you, Don. And Annie, uh, just by way of introduction, Annie Bistrom is founder of Cider and Love. It's a relatively new company, started last year, with a new concept. And Heritage Cider. Annie, I want to welcome you to Food and Wine and Cider. Hi, thanks so much for having me. You've had, uh, you've held several uh, senior positions in the cosmetics company, so I find it interesting that you founded a digital marketing company in food. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Sure. It's, uh, it's been a wild ride. But for me, it's always been about connecting with the consumer and giving them access to remarkable products. I've always worked with very high-quality products. Um, and for me, in the beauty industry, I felt it was time uh, for change, um, for me to pursue a passion which allowed me to introduce brand new, um, a brand-new category of products to an audience that I didn't think um, had access to it, namely cider, um, which is an incredible high-quality product, but a lot of people aren't fully aware of it. And in terms of digital, I'll just share that, you know, as we all know, the entire world is going digital. The cosmetics industry is very digital. So um, from our perspective, um, it was easy to make a switch into a digital marketing company because that's already what we're practicing across industries. Excellent. You described Cider and Love as a digital marketing startup promoting craft hard cider. You're also in New York. Can you explain a little bit further what that means? 
Yeah, sure. What Cider and Love is, is an online curator of fine heritage cider. So we work with small makers around the country, and we make it easy to find and discover, and most importantly, buy, um, hard to find extraordinary ciders online. So we're an online business only, ciderandlove.com, and um, that's what we focus on. The one thing I thought that might be helpful and um, is to actually clarify a really important term, which is what is cider? Um, cider itself is a really big, wide-ranging category. It's a very exciting category, and it's a big tent. We focus exclusively on the best of the best which means we work only in fine heritage cider. So what is that? Um, just in case you are curious, um, it means a cider that's only made with apples that are cider specific. Believe it or not, your lunchbox, Granny Smith, a Red Delicious, is not great for cider. Um, and this country has a very rich heritage of growing cider specific apples. In fact, Johnny Appleseed, he was planting um, apple seeds that were really going to be uh, grown into trees to be used for cider, not for pie. Um, and they make very different types of cider the same way that you would know that a Concord grape doesn't make a great wine. You probably might want a Pinot Noir grape. So just the way we know that the prints in the wine, so does the apple make a difference in the cider. And therefore, what we only work with is this really best-in-class, fine heritage cider. If you love fine wine, it's a really great opportunity to try something new with fine cider. So are there particular varieties of apples that make great cider, then? There are. Is it a, is fact, it a varietal? Yeah, there are so many, but unlike um, grapes, apples actually have thousands of different varieties. Um, in the United States alone, I believe that there's a book that covers about 10,000 varieties, and there's a reason for it, if we want to be a little geeky for a minute. Every seed from an apple tree, if it falls into the ground, it, every apple seed grows a snowflake apple, completely unlike anything else. So there are wild apples that are unnamed. And yes, some varietals are better for cider than for eating. And then there are heirloom varieties that can be good for both. Um, so great names out there are Newtown Pippin, Kingston Black, Dabinette, uh, Golden Russet. Um, they've got beautiful names, but they're more than I could list right now. And most ciders are um, actually blends of sometimes up to 20 different cider-specific apples and heirloom apples to create something really unique. You know, I'm, I'm just curious because of all the categories you could have chose, you chose cider <laughs> as your focus. How did that become the first one? What was um, it about I cider? I think because it's personal passion and it's really tasty. Um, I think that's so important that it tastes fantastic. And I'm such a fan of how cider tastes. I think that's really what drove me to it. And as I first fell in love with a sip and a glass, I got more interested in the category. And what I realized is not only is this a really delicious and very high quality artisanal product uh, made by people who regard cider making as an art, which you can clearly taste every time you're sipping one of these fabulous and remarkable ciders, but they also offer um, something unique, which is cider is a way to connect with real places in our own backyard in the United States, a concept of terroir for here, um, and connecting again with our history. I'm, um, I'm a New York City uh, woman, naturally. Uh, that's where I was born. I come from an urban world, but I still feel disconnected in our world of social media from, you know, reality sometimes. And I think what CIDR offers is an opportunity to be connected with landscapes and farms that are across the country in places that feel simply more authentic. Um, and for me, that made a very powerful story, and it, um, it became all-encompassing, as you can see. Is this a decidedly and singularly American product, cider? It is not. 
It is not an American product only, but it is very deep in our own history. In fact, cider was originally, um, the one, some, I can't say it was originally, but we know that even the ancient Romans were making cider. So that gives you a sense of the longevity of it. Classic historic cider regions across the world, famous ones include Spain, France, especially Normandy. There's a special place called the Route de Cidre where you can go and try a bunch of low biters on a 40-kilometer route. England and Ireland are also great cider um, uh, regions and have been historically. And it's because of the English that uh, when they came here as colonists, they very quickly started planting apples here. Originally, only crab apples grew in North America. So they brought over some English varietals um, with the original colonists and started making cider here in part because it was difficult to get accessible clean water when you were a pioneer and a colonist. Cider is, um, you know, not a, uh, it, it, it has a lower ABV um, alcohol content. And so many people were using it simply as a safer beverage to be drinking. We know our founding fathers drank cider tremendously. Ben Franklin famously said, uh, we're going to mangle the quote, but it's along the lines of, it, you know, tis better, don't eat apples, tis better to turn them all into cider. And so I misquoted Ben Franklin a little bit, but it will give you a sense of the history of it. And what do you know um, and what have you learned about con the consumers for these products? Well, it's really interesting. The cider market is going through a renaissance, and I would argue just the beginning of a renaissance in the United States. In other regions of the world, it is a far larger part of the alcohol market, specifically, say, in England. Um, we, so we're at the beginning of a renaissance. The market itself has tripled in a five-year period of time. So you have this huge burst of growth. And so there's a lot that we don't know, right? Data is only starting to be pulled together. But what we do know preliminarily is that cider drinkers are um, balanced gender-wise. Um, so it's one of the most gender-equal drinks. Uh, equal amounts of men and women enjoy cider. We know the younger you are, the more likely you are to um, try cider and enjoy cider. Mostly, we suppose, because young people, the younger you are, the more likely you are not to have a ingrained habit. You may try new And um, if you try it, people seem to love it. Um, and the other thing we know about cider is that people who love cider are typically people who have go out to eat a lot and go out to drink a lot because, again, they're the first adopters. So it's coming in, as you can see, from what we know about the consumer. Well, we've been talking with Annie Bistrin, who's the founder of Cider and Love. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, clearly a new online uh, concept in heritage cider. Um, what, Annie, what role do you play in the awareness and then the connection to the particular heritage cider maker? What, what, what's your role in that? So we act as curator, which really means that we go and we find the best makers and we go and visit them in person um, and we get to know them. So a big part of what we do is simply help them tell their stories to new audiences. Our role is truly as the marketer. Um, so, you know, when you are a farmer and you're growing apples and making them into cider, you have more than your hands full. Um, you know, also managing your marketing program is, um, is probably beyond the number of hours there is in the day. So what my role is, is to first find the makers and then bring their stories to life online and then to go and find the new consumer and bring them into the cider and love world. Um, but I will share with you that one of the most enticing and fabulous parts of this new role is that um, I've been able to take some extraordinary road trips to meet every one of the makers on our site and, you know, as an example, um, we work with a cidery up in the Finger Lakes region of New York, um, South Hill Cider, um, and the cider maker there is Steve Sellin. He works a lot with wild foraged apples. And last year, I got an opportunity to have him 
take me out on one of his foraging runs at the end of the day, and we walked around wild hedgerows and pulled apples out and ate them as the sun set. It was so enchanting. I thought, I have to bring this to more people to try. It tastes extraordinary. You know, you, uh, I think it's extraordinary that actually you visit each one of the heritage cider makers. Um, what, are, what are the things that you're looking for um, that says they should be on the Cider and Love site? Um, that's a really good question. You know, there are over 800 cideries in the United States today. Believe it or not, it's grown astronomically. But we only, our site right now has 10, and we are only planning to, you know, we're bringing in more people, but we like a very curated, edited approach. It will never be at that size. Um, and what we're looking for is truly best in class. So, first of all, not everybody makes heritage fine cider. That's okay. There are so many great fighters out there, and there's one for every taste and profile and person or whatever you love. There's something for you. Um, but what we love to focus on is this slice of the market that really is you consider the premium side. And these makers consider cider making an art. It's very easy when you meet with them to know how passionate they are, how creative they are. They are very focused on their fruit. So they're growing it or working with a local orchard to grow these unique apples that we talked about earlier, these cider-specific apples. And oftentimes they, are, they work at small batch. I mean, I would say everybody on our site is really a small maker um, and independent. We want to be able to tell these stories, people who are really making a, um, a living off the land and an art out of the apple. Okay. And, and I'm assuming that once uh, you've made that connection, you're, you have the, the um, cider maker, uh, the heritage cider maker on your site, then the consumer in going to your site then connects with them and, and maybe places an order that the cider maker has to fulfill. Is that kind of how it works? Kind of, but I'll put a wrinkle in it. We try to make it so easy. If you or any of your listeners have used Etsy in the past, um, mm -hmm. we're like the Etsy of Heritage Cider. So when you come into our site, the site is completely cohesive. You can look and learn about stories um, from every individual cider maker. You can see their orchards. You can learn about their products. You can see whether it's dry or sweet or still or sparkling. And then you can buy from cideries across the country in one single checkout basket. That's it. Um, the cideries themselves then fulfill the orders and ship the cider direct from the orchard to your door. Okay. So from a business perspective, there's always a business involved. How do you make money in this sector? It's a marketing fee. So that's what we are. We're marketers. So we, there's a marketing fee um, that the cideries work with us on. And, and uh, so do they, do they request to come to you or do you uh, go to them? How it's does that both. work? And I would mm -hmm. tell you that at the beginning, as you imagine, it was much of me coming to them. And now it is, um, more them coming to me. Um, we launched less than two months ago, um, just coming up on our two-month anniversary. And I can tell you since launch, we've been, I've been overwhelmed with requests from cideries um, trying to join. They feel like Cider and Love is a great representation of what they're doing, um, and they want to become a part of it. Um, and so right now, it's more a question of our bandwidth, um, making sure that we can give the same love and care to onboarding and selecting the right additional partners when the time is right. And um, I was going to ask a question about, um, and I think I lost my question, but I'm going to try and find it again. Uh, do what does someone who is on what would someone who is on your site today? And I know it's early days. What are what would they say is what Cider and Love has done for them in terms of awareness, in terms of sales? What what have you are heard? Are you talking about the consumer or the cidery? The cidery. I would say that the cidery, um, it's a huge learning process. I think for them, 
we are really telling their story in a way that they simply have not been able to do and to create a level of awareness for them that they have not been able to do um, on their own, mostly because of simple bandwidth issues of being a small maker um, and usually regionally based, often in areas without large consumer bases because they're rural. Um, you know, we have a much more national platform and allow them to get exposure through both our publicity efforts in national media, online, through social media, through our email to reach a much larger, larger audience. You know, in the few days, you know, sales grow every day. Um, but I think that ability to learn how to tell that story um, in a way that's engaging to a new consumer is something that you know, the lovely feedback we've gotten from the Cideries is that they feel like we're, we're doing the right work for them. Okay. So, and, and that's translating for them in terms of business, in terms of growth and that sort of thing. Is that, I'm just looking for anecdotally what they're, I, I, I get the whole, that. your ability to market for them is tremendous because they, it's very hard for them to do that for themselves. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm sure they're looking at, does this help me continue to grow my business? Well, I would say absolutely. That's the whole point of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a, our interests are deeply aligned. When we win, they win, and vice versa. I would tell you that, you know, we see our cideries leaning in um, very positively, not just um, because of the sales that we deliver, but the, you know, we're only two months in. Every new opportunity that we have to bring a cidery into a publicity effort and people who were hesitant about that now see the rewards of it and now want to participate more fully because they see that we've made it so easy for them to reach a new audience and that helps them with both online sales and offline sales through our site or through one of their distributor partners you know a rising tide lifts all ships mm -hmm. uh, just in terms of clarity because I get a little bit confused. It, are we talking about cider that has an alcohol content? Yes, we are. Okay. So that is okay. such a good question, Anne. It's funny. In this country, we have a very strange um, relationship to the word cider. If you say cider in any other English-speaking or, frankly, non-English-speaking country, they know exactly what you mean, alcoholic cider, which is the, um, an alcoholic beverage from fermented apples. They know what that means. Um, in this country, and I think I'm speculating here, but as a result of prohibition, cider was cider, but now there was this whole farm stand beverage that comes out that's sort of this beautiful apple juicy type of thing that's non-alcoholic that we also call cider, which makes everybody thoroughly confused. Um, you know, our attitude is that adding the hard in, when you come to our site, it is not difficult to understand what we're talking about. Right. Everything is in wine bottles and wine glasses, and we talk about tasting notes. We're very, we share the alcoholic content of every single product that we're selling right on the product page. So we're very clearly talking about alcoholic cider um, and really relating it to fine wine. And my hope is that we can get to a place where um, we don't have to add the hard in so, because it reminds mm -hmm. me of sort of hard lemonade or, right, right, right. you know, Spiked iced tea, you know, those are, <laughs> this, is, this sure. is what the fruit was originally intended to do. And the percentage of alcohol, if you compare it to wine or you compare it to beer, how does it, how does it compare? It's so, such a great question because it's a great advantage, I think, of cider, particularly, I would argue, for women. Um, beer, you can often find around 4 to 5%. Wine ranges, you know, but say 12 to 14% might be your average glass. Most of the ciders on our site, when you are doing a fine heritage cider, are around 7 to 9%, usually 8% alcohol. Um, and so what that does is allow people who say we're drinking wine, there's that whole trend of hashtag rosé all day, but I would actually like to ask how many women, how long can you truly drink rosé without keeling over? Um, mm. <laughs> I, I, envy, I envy beer drinkers who can really crack open a couple of cans during a game and enjoy themselves. Um, but for me, three glasses of wine and I'm out. Um, so cider is really, you know, the technical term is sessionable, but I would say it's a really friendly drink where you can enjoy something of that level of artistry as a fine wine, 
but you're not, it, it's not going to impact you at the same level. And the other pitch I have to throw in there is it's gluten free. Ah. Well, we've been talking with Annie Bistrin. Uh, she's the founder of Cider in Love. And I wanted to shift a little bit to your, you have a beginner's guide to cider style. Can you talk about mm-hmm. the different styles and how you talk about pairings with food? Sure. Um, one of the first things I tell people about the site is what consumers tell us is that they love the site because it really gives them a robust education and they can keep diving into more and more content about how to pair cider and what it goes well with and how to discover it because it's new to so many people. In fact, this week's email was all about pairing cider with Thai food. Uh, It can be very versatile and it should not always be paired just with your Thanksgiving turkey. Um, So in terms of styles, There are three major ways that we look at um, how to uh, analyze or get a quick handle or snapshot of a product, Um, and it's on every single product page. How dry or sweet is it? There's a scale. We put that on every single product page, dry to sweet. Maybe it's semi-dry. Maybe it's semi-sweet. Then there's, I think people may not know this, but cider is often sparkling, but there are also still ciders. So we put that on uh, the scale as well. And then we talk about tasting notes. Um, And we actually, on every product page, list the tasting notes. So you can see little pictures of the most important ones, whether it's a grapefruit or maybe it's um, a little rock to indicate mineral, or um, maybe it's a mushroom because it's earthy and mushroomy. And you can actually go onto the site and shop by whichever notes really appeal to you. So maybe you love citrusy ciders. You can go online and shop by just citrusy ciders and pull those up. Or you might be somebody who really wants something a little unexpected, perhaps even funky, um, a natural wild fermented cider, and you can shop by that too. Um, And in terms of pairings, we have huge amounts of rich content online about how to pair with pretty much every, um, not every food under their sun, but quite a few. Um, And I'd say there's some really easy guides for people to think about when they're pairing. You know, if you have something that's really rich, like a really rich brie or a, you know, dark stew, you know, that's just delicious, sometimes, like in wine, it's great to be able to pair that with something that's really crisp and acidic and bubbly because it cuts through. And so, you know, as an example, I, in that case, would recommend we've got a great maker called Redbird Orchard Cider, and they have a beautiful cider called Celeste Lee that's made like a champagne, and it's beautiful. Um, You know, likewise, if you have something sort of crunchy and salty and savory, like, I mean, I'm thinking about it because of the time of year, some roasted corn, um, corn on the cob. Um, You know, I might recommend you pair that with something a little bit sweeter um, and perhaps tart. We have a rhubarb cider from Eagle Mount or La Fontaine from Slybro. And those would taste beautiful because they've got lots of lovely, luscious fruit notes. You know, I I have so many other questions that I I wanted to ask you. um, And um, I've been told I I have time for one, one last question, which is like, really tough for me to figure out which one I want to ask you. You know, I know it's really um, early days, but um, what are some of the lessons learned that you've had so far from this experience? Um, You know, that's such a really, it's a good question. I would say first be humble and curious. I've had such a learning um, and and such treasures um, from going and learning a brand new category of meeting makers. Um, You know, be really hopeful. You know, this was uh, a little spark of an aha idea, and I trotted around in my car driving around to farms around the country and found people who were willing to believe in the dream, too, which was, you know, just a joy and a shock. So I'm so delighted by that. And then, you know, be really grateful um, for finding great partners. I've been blessed by finding, um, you know, everybody from web development to PR team who's really strong and savvy. You know, when you're a small entrepreneur, you know, people are what are going to make or break you. So to have people who are really good at their jobs but also are as passionate about it as you are and can work in your budget, (laughs) those things are incredible. 
Um, so I'm really grateful for them. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, Don, I think we've had a, I had so many more questions for you, Annie, but uh, <laughs> we've had wonderful conversation. There's more I wanted to learn in terms of how you, you know, you set up the business and the fact that you can help market these companies is just uh, bringing a whole new category to life, actually. So I, I think it's really fantastic. Don, I think I'm going to switch it over to you to, to close the fest. We have been talking uh, with Annie Bystrom. She leads Cider in Love. A link to her website will be on foodandwineinsider.com tonight, where you can hear this and every other program. Annie, your website again for our listeners? It's ciderinlove.com. Okay. Uh, You can uh, hear this program and every other past and future Food and Wine Insider program on foodandwineinsider.com. Thank you so much for being with us, Annie. It's it's been a a very illuminating. Food and Wine Insider.